forward to it. Thank you again for joining us for the um, uh, Georgia Healthcare Innovation Challenge. Uh, I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes tonight just sort of resetting the table because we have a couple of folks who are new to us and may not have the full background of it. We're not going to go through a lot of detail. And then uh, just to set the table, then Isabel is going to go through uh, the two pitches at a high level, again, just to reset the table to make sure we're all understanding what the key uh, pro projects are. And then, uh, then we'll get into the, the pitches themselves. And then once all the pitches are done, that's the core part of the program, but once the pitches are done, the CEOs will go into recess to evaluate what they heard between last week and between this week. And then hopefully they will come out with some announcements of some winners. That's, that's our plan tonight and we'll see if we can get there. And then we'll have a couple of wrap up items at the tail end to talk about next steps and to share one or two other little things. So uh, we feel like we, we're pretty confident we can get everybody out here by seven, you know, perhaps a couple of minutes early. So uh, just a basic refresh, uh, the core team here includes Isabel Magnum, who's the innovation leader for Navison Health. Uh, and she'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, I'm with, I'm the chair of, of uh, the Digital Health Society of uh, TAG. Uh, AT Gimmel is uh, one of the partners at ATV and Atlanta Ventures. And then Christopher Cunney is a board member of HEMS and a past president of Georgia HEMS. And of course, uh, we have other day jobs associated with that. But we're representing these four organizations who banded together to foster collaboration between medical providers and technology providers. Uh, at a high level, uh, we've had a 13 week program that JC alluded to a moment ago. It started with the reverse pitch on July 30th and culminating tonight. And there's two phases. The first phase, we uh, basically took a lot of uh, uh, submissions. We ended up having 23 submissions between the two challenges. Uh, we selected U7 finalists uh, at the end of August. Actually, it bled over into early September because we had such a uh, strong uh, uh, number of uh, proposals. And then you guys spent the last eight weeks, probably really seven weeks, <clears throat> refining your, your pitches and customizing your solutions. And then so tonight we're culminating with this uh, event here. And so... Uh, one of the things that uh, we want to do is, uh, and there will be some you know, PR coming out of this when we're done, and then uh, Dale and Laura uh, will begin working with the finalists, the winners, excuse me, uh, within the next week or two, because we, we understand it'll take a couple of months to get ready for the pilot. Okay. All right. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Isabel, who's going to background us a little bit about Navison Health and then begin to set up the challenges. Isabel. Thank you, Chris. Just got a ray of sunshine here. It looks like the storm is gone. Um, thank you, everybody. It's an absolute pleasure to be in front of you all again today, 13 weeks later. I am thankful for our partnership with uh, Chris Carabinos at TAC Digital Health, um, AT Gimble of Atlanta Ventures, and Christopher Cooney and Seppi Browning of Georgia Ham. Um, this is a partnership between our four organizations, and uh, we couldn't have done it on our own. Today, the time doesn't allow for me to express my gratitude for all the startups present. Thank you for contributing to the improvement of healthcare. Thanks for your, your being gutsy, gutsy and willing to learn and pivot. Uh, we know you all put a lot of effort into this Georgia Healthcare Innovation Challenge. It really showed by the quality of your demos, your approaches to the challenge, your willingness to partner with us. So thank you, thank you. Thanks a million. And as we live through the most transformative period in healthcare in our lifetime, we don't have the expertise to do it on our own at Navicent at Atrium Health. We can't do it without you. So we need your partnership. We need your innovative mindset, your expertise in the latest technology, your enthusiasm for transforming healthcare. And you've, you've done that. You help challenge the norm and the status quo Thank you for making, making healthcare a better place. I'm really, really grateful for this last 13 weeks. And in fact, I'm sitting here in the office and I'm looking at the, the board that AT, Chris and I, we started working on. It was in March, on March 5th of this year, before the coronavirus hit our country so badly. And we had seven challenges and then we narrowed it down to two. Then, um, yeah, we spent uh, a good part of the day in this little office that I'm in. So good memories here. Thank you for the partnership. So next slide, Chris, please. In terms of Navison Health, 
we serve a service area of 30 counties and um, in Georgia and a population of nearly 750,000 persons. Um, there, there are also exciting times for Madison Health. As you know, we combined with Atrium Health, which is headquartered in Charlotte, North Carolina. And Atrium Health is one of the largest health systems in the Southeast. And you may have heard uh, recently about our strategic move with Wake Forest, which will benefit the Southeast and therefore Georgia. Um, so we are very excited to see uh, more the, the Atrium family growing. Next one, please. All right, now on to the first challenge. I know you're all eager to hear the pitches from our four finalists for the first challenge. Dale Boyston is the CEO of TC2, an accountable care organization serving Middle Georgia, of which Madison Health is a founding member. And the intent of this challenge that Dale pitched back at the end of July is, uh, and that finalists are pitching back uh, to you today, is to look for early and actionable insights into rising risk beneficiaries. Um, ultimately, this is about improving patients' lives through better health. So next slide, please. We're gonna start with Maya, and uh, then we'll go to Archimedes Medical, then Shore and Javion. Maya is out of California, so they didn't have a uh, gale force winds last night, but uh, you know, a part of California is still burning. So we all have our challenges here. I'm, I'm glad you're able to join us. And Archimedes Medical is in Savannah, Georgia. Shore and Javion are in Atlanta, Georgia. And so you will have five minutes to demo. Uh, after five minutes, I will turn on my video and they will do the same. That will be your, your hint to uh, wrap it up. And we'll have up to three minutes for Q&A. So Maya, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And just checking, you want me on video while I'm presenting, I assume. Yeah. Okay, super. Thanks for the introduction and I uh, commend everyone involved in the, the challenge uh, and the coaches and everyone involved in the organization of this. It's been very well structured and kind of a, a real uh, joy to be a part of. Um, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Maya Health. My name is Simon McGibbon. I am uh, joined uh, on the Zoom by uh, Brian Smith, who's our CTO and a fellow co-founder uh, who will be available for a Q&A. Um, uh, we're thrilled to be uh, finalists in this challenge. Uh, this is the type of unmet need in healthcare for which we actually, you know, left our, our real jobs and, and started the business in, in this platform. Uh, so this is a, a near and dear uh, to our heart and, and it's, um, you, know, you know, really wonderful to see uh, um, that you are so progressive when you're thinking about, uh, about using technology in new ways. Um, I am going to share screen and uh, walk you through our pitch. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, the first thing to know about us, uh, because you probably don't know the name Maya Health, is that we are the uh, an operating system for value-based care and for virtual care. Uh, one of our key customers is Mercy Virtual, uh, which is the country's first virtual hospital uh, based in Chesterfield, Missouri. Uh, Mercy Virtual uh, was uh, started by Mercy Health a uh, large uh, faith-based uh, uh, hospital system. And uh, for Mercy, we do everything from um, virtual, you know, virtual care end-to-end -end from RPM and devices in people's homes, getting data every day, predictive analytics, uh, and um, cl the clinician application that nurses, advanced practitioners, and physicians work in to manage a very high-risk uh, chronic population at scale. And so we know this problem very well and uh, it is what we do uh, every day. Um, we also have a, you know, we've, we've built a, an assembled a team to take on this challenge in healthcare um, from, you know, everything from health tech backgrounds, um, big tech, data science and experience design. And um, the point of this is that diversity of experience and, and expertise in healthcare is incredibly important, um, you know, as illustrated by how um, perhaps sorely lacking good patient facing and clinician facing tools uh, ha have been in, in healthcare. It's really a dearth of, of that. And this requires a lot of different perspectives and expertise to come together with the requisite deference for, for healthcare, uh, but also able to infuse um, you know, best of breed technologies and thinking from, from other industries. 
Um, before even you know talking more about what we do, we want to really anchor on the fact of how committed we are to fostering health equity. And this is a particularly important part of solving this challenge in, in, in a robust and, and uh, appropriate way. Uh, this means very specific things like fairness constraints are designed into machine le learning models. Uh, we make use of social determinants of health data as we know how incredibly predictive it is and useful it is to, to understand imminent risk uh, in, in individuals. Um, but also, you know, for the, for the action taking uh, side of healthcare as well. Um, and then, you know, patient, patient facing technologies uh, need to function regardless of financial uh, uh, means or access to broadband and smartphone and technology, the extent possible technology is in the background. The first thing in this challenge, uh, speed of data counts in chronic care is incredibly important. Um, and this is well known to the, the, the challenge that today you have uh, claims data that you're relying on. Uh, and this, this is very aged, this is, this is dated, it comes in too late. Uh, here in the, these purple, this purple distribution here, you can see the um, days between uh, inter-event intervals, so days between um, subsequent hospitalization events. And so you can see how important it is to be getting data on a much more fr frequent basis than is what is possible from, from Medicare claims data that you're utilizing today. Not only that, there's signals in the data from, from the EHR in particular that uh, you don't get from Medicare claims data. So uh, and for this reason, this is a a hit requires a heavy lift in terms of getting this data collected and, and access and, and into a, a single um, uh, repository, but it's well worth the effort. Um, here are the types of data we use to predict rising risk beneficiaries before they come high risk. This, this is a problem we, we work on already. And um, from an MVP perspective, or um, you know, the beta phase uh, in, in this challenge, uh, we're going to be making use of EHR data, claims data, uh, input of clinician judgment uh, as a having clinician in the loop, and then uh, census data as a, an initial minimal viable approach to getting a read on social determinants of, of health. And we bring these things together through a range of different uh, integration mechanisms uh, in, into um, a, a cloud-based infrastructure. Um, as I said, we, we do this um, uh, every day. Um, this is an example of some of the performance of one of our, um, of our machine learning models. Uh, here, we were able to, act, uh, with 90% accuracy, um, predict uh, which um, temporal bin a patient would fall into. And so these, these are days uh, before hospitalization. And you can see 0 to 14, 15 to 30, 31 to 90 plus. Uh, so this is something that we, we know um, this particular um, performance was based on training of uh, a proprietary data asset we have, which involves 100 million uh, record uh, patients, uh, patient records from, from an EHR, over 10,000 unplanned medical events. Hey, and this Simon? is, um, yeah. I mean, we're at five minutes. Oh, geez. I'm so beyond. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you get the sense we know what we're doing. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we bring all this data into a patient profile. Uh, so this is available to clinicians. You know, behind all this data and analytics, of course, are real people. Uh, that's incredibly important to remember. And we can support uh, TC2's growth uh, in, in expansion capabilities end to end. And thank you, Simon. I'm going to invite uh, Dale for a question. Well, uh, first off, Simon, uh, from my standpoint, I want to thank you very much for the time and effort to, you know, that you put into this, because obviously um, there's some pretty impressive work that's been done. You know, we were very impressed with uh, the overall display, you know, the way in which the, the data was laid out. But one thing that, you know, that I would like to ask, and this is something that may be a little more oriented towards Brian uh, than towards you, you know, is, uh, is the use of these 100 million records, um, you know, in terms of how they might help inform the work we're doing. And, and I preface, you know, your answer with the following. You all know that we work with a relatively small population overall. Uh, we're going to be limited initially largely to claims data and some EHR feeds. So the question is, how does that insight from the other work really kind of inform 
you know, what we might be getting from that in predictive analytics? Yeah, great question. Thanks. Um, it's mostly uh, a huge head start, actually, that we have in order to take the feature space that we can derive from your more limited data set, both claims and the, the bit of EHR data we will get. And we'll use that to do what's uh, generally referred to as lookalike modeling. And if you're not familiar with that, I can explain briefly, uh, which is based on the attribute space that we have in common, which there will be a, a large degree of overlap between that 100 million uh, record data set that we have and, and your patient set. Uh, what it allows us to do is to identify uh, who in your patient data set is most similar to that historical data set that we've uh, curated and trained our models on. And we use that to sort of jumpstart the analysis, if that makes sense. And, and I can provide further detail if you're interested. Okay, well, that, that's helpful because that was one of the things of interest to us is obviously the data set off of which you work as compared to the relatively limited data set we could provide as we got started. Thank you. Well, that, that was great. Thank you so much. Uh, Simon and team for uh, that presentation. Thank you, Dale, for your question. Moving on now to Archimedes Medical. I guess Chris is presenting. Uh, yes, thank you, Isabel. Let me uh, get my screen up here. And... Okay, good to go. Okay, well, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, for those of you who have not met, uh, my name is Chris Wixon. I'm a practicing vascular surgeon, and I'm the founder of Archimedes Medical. We are a physician-driven data science company, and our mission is to discover insights that are hidden in big healthcare data. Now, before I get started, I wanted to remind everybody that every medicine that we prescribe, every procedure we perform, and every test that we order has potential consequences. Even the nature of disease prediction algorithms has the potential to do the same. In my own personal practice, nearly every week, a new patient shows up with a diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease. That disease was generated by some algorithm from one of the large Medicare Advantage programs. And the thing that's remarkable about it is that 100% of the patients were completely asymptomatic. How then could the machine have known that the patient had the disease process? And the short answer is that it didn't. After I examined the patients and performed diagnostic testing, I determined that actually only one patient had the condition. The problem, of course, is that predicting future disease states at the individual level is extremely difficult to do. Too often, it leads to a statistical problem called overfitting or false positives. And physicians are finding themselves today in a position of having to prove that a particular disease does not exist. It wastes resources, creates anxiety and confusion for patients, and it subjects them to unnecessary tests and procedures. So if we're going to use algorithms to predict disease states, we're gonna to need to do it very cautiously. At Archimedes, we believe that we are uniquely qualified to solve this problem using our novel data asset, the Archimedes, novel, uh, the, the Archimedes knowledge graph. Now graphs in general capture underlying heuristics through connected data, and they're changing the way that we do deep learning. A knowledge graph specifically takes this one step further. By enriching data with, trusted, with a trusted source of truth, it keeps the machine learning from getting too far outside of clinical expectations and prevents the problem of overfitting. In a knowledge graph, a condition such as congestive heart failure does not exist as an isolated data point, but it exists in a network of known relationships relevant to the concept, such as shortness of breath, edema, and Lasix. These are just a few examples, but the result is a web of information, millions of nodes connected by 10 millions of relationships. In short, what we've done is we've created a simulator for the human condition. And in the game of inference, it gives us a significant head start. Now, from my personal perspective as a physician, too often our healthcare technology has been built without seeking adequate clinical input. And I think the electronic health record is a prime example, not us. Our methods place clinical knowledge squarely in the middle of the solution. So how do we do this? Presently, we're using the knowledge graph as part of a forward feed neural network 
that uses historical claims to determine probability of future disease states. Now, as I noted earlier, this is a very difficult problem. And naturally, as a physician, I was quite dubious as whether it could be done in a meaningful manner. But what I'm seeing the machine produce is really quite remarkable. Here are just a few examples. These are costly medical conditions. And when we back tested our predictions using receiver operator curves, what we're finding is that the model is producing accuracies which range from 62 to 83% accuracy. And as our domain experts grow our model and deploy more sophisticated neural network techniques, I anticipate that these scores will trend higher. Here's another unique feature of our dashboard. It provides an interactive representation of the patient journey and allows users to contextually visualize a patient's history and explore root cause morbidities. And when risk is identified, we provide the tools necessary for the user to make an informed decision when pairing that patient with a provider who is both experienced and efficient. Our system is pilot ready. And we've successfully interfaced with other electronic health record systems and our systems are an integral part of many physicians daily workflow. The application deploys securely either on or off premises. In closing, I'd like to say that while we're a young company, we see strength as we offer a solution that is custom built around you. What we're seeking is a meaningful partnership that will help us both to flourish. One that will help us fine tune the engine and meet the needs of a growing value-based care system and then to have its debut run on your racetrack. Thank you very much. Well, well done on keeping the Swiss time uh, here, uh, Chris. That's <laughs> very well done. All right, I'm going to invite Dale to ask you a question. All right, well, good afternoon, Chris. How are you? Great. Um, you know, first off, as uh, we said to Simon, we, we so appreciate the, you know, the thinking and the effort that went into this. You know, I was very, very interested in kind of the graph logic approach that you all used because essentially it uses one of the data sources that we have most, you know, that, that frankly we have um, complete data sets for, which is really the claims data versus a lot of the other um, elements, at least beginning from a predictive standpoint. I like the idea that, you know, this might work on small samples and with incomplete data because that defines some of the issues that we've been working with in terms of improving our predictive modeling. When I actually saw the graph laid out, one of the first things um, that I thought was that this would work very, very well for a, a physician, a diagnostician, who is looking to better understand the interrelationship of these conditions. But the question that I wanted to ask you really related to the use of this for other team members. Uh, you remember as we work with practices, we use population, uh, a population health center approach where we have folks who are nominally trained in medicine who are essentially working with the practices. So the question is, how might they use the solution that you've got here as extenders you know, of the physician practice itself because most of the physicians just don't have enough time to make use of those insights. Okay, yeah, good question. So one of the things that I didn't show here because we were a little pressed for time was the ability to do sort of cohort analysis. So the nature of a graph allows us to take a particular population set and slice and dice that in whatever particular manner we feel, or you know, that the, that the user feels of interest. If there's a if there's an interest in exploring congestive heart failure or renal failure or you know depression, um, whatever those things are, we can identify those patients very very easily. We can retrospectively look at that particular cohort. We can model whether the uh, you know the, the observed to expected outcomes are what, what they should be. And then we can actually make predictions based on the individuals that are part of that cohort as to what future disease states um, uh, they may be at risk for. Okay, so just as a second question related that you might see then our population health center folks in assisting the practices would use that cohort analysis. Would I identify some other rising risk candidates uh, that might in fact uh, merit additional attention and, um, and essentially work with the physician 
you know, to move in that direction early? Is that kind of the way you're thinking about it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, one of the things that a graph does very well is, is it does it does pattern recognition. And Simon alluded, I think Simon alluded to it. So the identifi the, the identification of sort of bioidentical twins, the tool has the, actually, we actually do this right now. And it's one of the methods that we use to, to score future uh, disease states. So when you look at a patient's retrospective history, we can very easily spin out cohorts of individuals that are quite similar to that patient. Some may be further along the chronic disease path, some may, may be lesser. Um, but identifying groups of patients that are like other patients um, is, is one of the technologies that we, we actually do. And I, I didn't show it here today. All right, thanks, okay. Chris. Thank, Thank you. you, Chris. Yep, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, next is Shore. Shore, I guess, is Barry presenting? Yes. Um, give me Thank one you. second. I will share my screen. All right. Are you guys able to see my screen? All right. On behalf of Shore Health, I want to thank you for selecting us as a finalist for the Georgia Healthcare Innovation Challenge. I hope you enjoy our presentation today. Every month, TC2 executives spend precious time manipulating data, time that should be spent coordinating patient care. CMS has three expectations of ACOs, better care, smarter spending, and healthier people. Door Health has the solution. We've assembled a team of the nation's leading uh, experts, Dr. George Boxavanos, Joan Goodrow, Dr. Vipin Ramani, and Valerie Barkov. Our solution is simple, empower humans with digital employees. Meet Amy, Shore Health AI model execution engine. Amy is our existing core repository for a library of solutions accumulated over years of work. Concepts of supervised learning, unsupervised learning are supplemented by the knowledge base we have aggregated. Using our existing risk management framework, Amy predicts a beneficiary state of health. Amy and the learning data engine gather the data, validate information, and create the beneficiary view. The result is a 3D cube with a simple way to access data. The first access is the current risk estimate, the second is the direction of risk, and the third is the confidence level. Users click on sub cues to drill down to patient detail. Now meet Trish, our trusted revenue innovation for smart healthcare. Trish is our repository or library of solutions for the healthcare sector. Trish eliminates the need for hours of data manipulation. Dynamic case-based reasoning is the module at the core of this solution and the model is ready to be trained with TC2 data. As new cases are presented, Trish tests the cases against the domain knowledge and generates a proposed solution. And the Shore team has many successful implementations. Large national bank where we identify increasing risk customers. A large accounting firm with successful deployment of an AI engine. Now, once the model is trained with TC2 data, the way TC2 works will look very different. Rather than pull monthly files, Amy will automatically retrieve them. TC2 users will have a customized dashboard where they can drill down by practice, by patient, or by rising risk. Users will receive alerts, and these smart alerts will let the user know that it's time to intervene. Now what if what you've been thinking was high risk really wasn't? Patients who needed you most never got help. Now imagine knowing that a patient was at risk before those events ever occurred, and your actions prevented the illness. Now, 
isn't that why we all got into healthcare in the first place? With Amy and Trish, TC2 will spend less time manipulating data and more time helping patients. The result? Better care. Smarter spending and healthier people. Now we're proud of the work that we're doing here at Shore Health. As we mentioned in the presentation, the model that will be used to identify rising risk patients is ready to be trained with TC2 data. While our solution is a customized solution, it is built on top of 300 plus successful AI implementations. We want to thank you one last time and wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Barry. Thank you, Shore. Uh, Dale, on to you for questions. Great. Well, first off, um, great presentation. Uh, nicely done. And obviously, you know, those are the issues that we wrestle with uh, in terms of how we use our limited resources to actually target the right folks. And we do spend an inordinate amount of time uh, trying to identify those folks and uh, doing a, a, a best passable job. Here is what first comes to mind. I love the three-dimensional structure and the different elements with that. But this question I think goes probably more to you, Devin, because when you talk about those 300 implementations and the AI related, I think one of the things you'd mentioned in the past was its reliance on what we might call socioeconomic you know, data uh, and the ability to do that for banks to identify risk. So in addition to the claims, because obviously we know that's something that we do have available, how would you think you know, the, the social determinants of health and the socioeconomic data that you could bring to bear, much as you've used uh, you know, in the financial world, would really enrich the picture for us? Yeah, that's a good question, Dale. I think uh, what can be done is uh, different data sets which bring in different elements like the socioeconomic. I think what it feeds into is what kind of challenges do they feed? And when you're building this AI models, allows it to learn um, what is the interaction between the outcomes that you're looking for and the inputs that these provide. So it's, it's that har harmony that needs to be uh, trained. And then eventually as the system starts learning, it can start holding in on as to what are the implications of that uh, uh, situation. Okay, I still wrestle with a little bit what the, what some of those data elements you think might be most appropriate. You know, certainly based on the experience you've had in identifying what you call the rising risk financial folks, how we might use some of that. You know, in healthcare. Yeah, I mean, uh, so let me juxtapose the financial risk issues, right? Uh, the kind of um, data that we used to use is. Um, because those are financial credit uh, elements. What you're getting is actual financial situation in certain of those household income, um, uh, sort of uh, where they live, uh, the kind of uh, conditions they might be facing. And you bring those into there to, uh, to figure out what kind of uh, uh, sort of domino effects that drives. Mm -hmm. um, so you start creating some sort of financial ratios uh, that uh, basically that help the model uh, be accurate in its prediction. Okay. Well, that, that helps uh, because that to me, I think is a, is a big you know, value add that I think we're looking for beyond the claims data. And uh, it's you know, good to hear how that might fit in. So thank you very much, both you, Valerie, and you, Devin. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Shore. Now, the last finalist for the first challenge is Javion, and we have Todd from his Jeep, unless uh, you managed to uh, reintegrate your house. I hope, I hope you have. Go on. Good talk. evening, all. Can you all hear me okay? Oh, are you guys able to hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Oh, very yes. good. Uh, and see the screen okay? Yes. Yes. Excellent. Um, so, uh, yes, I, I'm not in my Jeep right now, uh, but uh, uh, my bandwidth connectivity is a bit questionable, so I'm not going to do video if that's okay with everybody. Um, but uh, I do appreciate very much the opportunity to uh, uh, participate in the uh, Georgia Healthcare Innovation Challenge um, and have a chance to work with 
uh, the TC2 team and others over the last uh, several weeks. Um, it's also been a pleasure to, to hear some really great presentations uh, and, and the opportunity to kind of bring in, uh, uh, save, save for, for last. So thank you very much for that. Um, for those I haven't had a chance to chat with before, my name's Todd Schlesinger. Uh, I am the Vice President of Business Development for Javion, uh, actually one of the founding members uh, and have been with the organization since, since really the beginning. Uh, Javion is a prescriptive analytics company based out of uh, Johns Creek, Georgia. Uh, we're made up of a group of uh, physicians, clinicians, data scientists, um, and for the last 11 years, we've really been focused on uh, helping healthcare organizations of lots of different size and, and, and shape to proactively identify uh, and manage unforeseen risk um, uh, at the individual level. Um, we've received some pretty neat awards uh, over the years um, for our ability to really move the needle uh, to help or organizations really address those uh, uh, meaningful outcomes around quality focus, um, uh, patient outcomes, and uh, cost and utilization uh, measures, um, and uh, uh, have really seen some neat impact over the over the last few years. Um, if we're selected to partner with TC2 and, and team, um, you know, we're really going to work very closely with them to answer three critical critical questions. Uh, who is at rising risk for a health regression that should be focused on? How best to engage with them, and and what are the most appropriate actions should be that should be taken uh, to best manage the cost and and utilization? Uh, to do this, we're, we're we will bring um, and leverage the JV on core, uh, which is a member centric risk a series of member centric risk models. Uh, which maintains a repository of clinical and socioeconomic data uh, on about 35 million lives today. Um, we have, uh, again, clinical and socioeconomic information uh, on those individuals, which allows us to really provide uh, insights um, into you know, who is specifically at risk for an adverse clinical outcome, uh, what are the factors themselves, uh, which, which are the most critical factors that are driving them to that high risk category. And, and most importantly, what we hang our hat on is being able to provide information on the specific interventions, the actions, programs that should be taken that can mitigate the risk for, for that individual. Um, we leverage uh, huge amounts of SDOH data that we own, that we license, that we purchase. Um, having the data is not really the, the important part from our perspective. It's over the 10 years that we've been able to create and, and understand the clinical correlations of that clinical data to an individual's uh, potential risk. Um, we, we think, you know, from the experience that we've had working with clients uh, over the last uh, nearly 11 years, um, you know, a, a basic analysis and, and, and experience with uh, our client base, we think we can have a pretty significant impact uh, working with uh, TC2 and helping augment the uh, case management workflows. Um, something that we have, you know, created a process that we've been able to replicate and see time and time again that uh, our methodology that, that we bring to the table, be, being able to really um, uh, provide uh, uh, ongoing assistance across the uh, implementation, uh, uh, clinical expertise, um, understanding the value uh, attainment to operationalize this information, to put it where it can be the most impactful and the least disruptive uh, into workflow is uh, you know, the resources and expertise that we're gonna bring to to this engagement. Um, I think overall, really what we kind of hang our hat on is the strategic approach to prevention, being able to identify and target the right individual uh, with the right intervention at the right time to be as efficient and effective as possible with, um, uh, with the resources and services available. And we also believe that once we, we really establish a relationship, um, we're gonna be able to work together uh, to really leverage what we call our the AI asset, the core of all of this, um, uh, to be able to look at at, at risk and and uh, and outcomes across the the enterprise um, with a number of things that we we are use cases that we can address today. Hey Todd, well done. Um, the time's up. Thank you for your presentation, uh, Dale. What questions do you have? 
Well, first off, Todd, again, uh, as with everyone else, thanks for taking the time uh, to really think about our challenge uh, and come to the table uh, with something that uh, you believe would, would assist us in, uh, in successfully addressing that challenge. One of the things that stands out for me here, the identification uh, that you had there of the 25,000 lives down to 125 high-risk folks, obviously down to those top five interventions a couple of slides back. One of the things, obviously, you know, we've made clear is the fact that we're relying at this point very heavily on, on the claims data. Uh, there'll be some limited uh, EHR data. But you talked extensively about the social determinants of health data. If we're looking strictly at the social determinants of health data and the claims data, do, you know, how close are you to that you know, prediction that you had before that instead of, you know, getting five out of 600 or getting five out of 32? In other words, does it get you most of the way there? Or, you know, are we still missing something pretty big if we're only limited in our ability to bring in the HR data near term? Yeah, uh, Dr. Showalter, do you actually want to take that sure. one? Sure, yeah, I'll happily take that. So, you know, we actually work with a number of ACOs uh, or payers where really all they have is the claims data plus what we bring to supplement. Uh, where we're looking at that example where, you know, getting to the top um, half a percent, the 125 out of um, 25,000, um, that is actually, you know, extrapolated results from our clinical studies, our clinical trials that we've done uh, that were done solely on claims data and SGOH. Uh, so we do get a slightly better performance. We might get a, you know, a five to 10 percent lift. Uh, if we're able to incorporate labs data um, and, and order information from the EHR. Um, but that performance piece where we were able to um, save over uh, $500 per uh, member actually engaged and contacted uh, is based upon a claims and Javion uh, data repository uh, result. So it's an apples to apple comparison uh, to what you guys are able to provide. Okay, well, that's you know very very helpful, and it looks like uh, there is some flexibility in the in the uh, data presentation. Yeah, more or less the uh, the screenshot where uh, I could see folks who would be using this could actually enter the updated information as the interventions they're undertaking that could be effectively recorded, you know, in that same data set. That's uh, yes, that could be effectively recorded, and it's actually then fed back into our analytics. Uh, to understand what are the most effective interventions for TC2, not just generically, what are the most effective interventions across uh, across our client base? Okay, that is helpful. Well, thank you for that, for the presentation and uh, for your answers to those couple of questions. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Javion. Now, Chris, can you share the screen again? And we're gonna move on to challenge two which is um, which was pitched originally by Laura Gentry, who is the CEO for the Medical Center of Peach County Madison Health. And um, this challenge is not new. It's um, there's been about three years of projects and grants performed at Fort Valley in Georgia, which is an area that um, Laura's hospital covers which is within Peach County. And the purpose of the challenge really is to bridge the gap the knowledge gap in pediatric asthma. What all these projects have uh, brought to light is that there is a misunderstanding of what asthma is and what asthma triggers amongst the population that we serve in middle Georgia. So ultimately, we want to help um, sustainably improve the health of our children in Fort Valley and in middle Georgia. Okay, so the first one to present will be 360 MedLink. They are coming to us from Montreal, Canada, but do have clients in um, uh, in the U.S. And so, 360 MedLink, you have five minutes to pitch and up to three minutes for Q&A. I will turn my video back on as we get to five minutes. Go ahead, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here today. All right, everybody can see this here. I'm gonna assume that's a yes, great. So uh, like Isabel said, my name is Katie Deutsch and I'm here with my colleagues, John Manasse Tiagen. He's the founder and CEO of 360 MedLink, as well as our chief medical officer, Dr. Azat Saad. We'll all be available at the end to answer any questions 
problems that you might have. So we're here to present Tavi Breeze. This is our comprehensive solution to help you improve care for families and communities with pediatric asthma. I'm gonna tell you a little more about 360 MedLink. We have 35 employees in three countries, and this is our core team for this project. We have experience in healthcare, technology, business, and research. And we use this collective experience to create innovative, empathetic, patient-centered solutions that provide real value for the patient and payer. Our business is broader than just app development. We are a digital therapeutics company that builds comprehensive, clinically validated ecosystems that are tailored to the solution that each challenge requires. We understand that asthma is one of the primary diagnoses for children at the Medical Center of Peach County Emergency Department, and that you've seen firsthand the negative effects that this has had on your community, both in poor medical outcomes and in other ways, such as children missing too many school days due to poorly controlled asthma. Tavi Breeze is a solution that will help you work towards improving these clinical outcomes in a different way. Our applications and platforms address the desires of healthcare providers, patients, and the healthcare system, and provide functionalities and clinical validation that most marketplace offerings do not have. Tavi Breeze for Children with Asthma and Their Family is built on our currently existing successful Tavi framework, which is easily scalable and customizable. The apps for adults and children are available on cell phone or tablet, Apple or Android, and are made to operate at very low to no bandwidth. For healthcare providers and stakeholders, we offer web-based communications and data analysis platforms that are easily accessed on any web browser. Our solution, for, our solution is built on our clinically validated Tabby platform, which qualitative and quantitative research has shown to be as effective as in-person coaching, as well as something that patients are highly satisfied with. These results have been published in 16 peer-reviewed articles, and it's one of the primary reasons that we have been selected as the sole source vendor by the state of Rhode Island's Office of Health and Human Services. Our work with the state of Rhode Island has involved an extremely disenfranchised population living with HIV, and we have worked with them together to provide a customized TAVI solution that has proven to have been successful as demonstrated by significant improvement in the group's overall health outcomes. Our solution to this challenge is multifaceted with tailored apps for the patient or, and parent or adult caregiver, a care management platform for the healthcare provider, and a data analysis platform for the pair. Breeze focuses on older children because our solution is well adapted for this age group, but will be easily expandable to younger children as well. So this shows you what Tavi Breeze looks like. Gamification is a large part of why our past solutions have been so successful. And this shows you how an older child would select a Tavi Breeze asthma quest where they would pick what topic they want to learn about. They can download the video that it's pre-recorded, so they can download it for offline use. And then they get celebrated and rewarded for completing each small but important step. Our Tavi Breeze solution Will be built organically from our established framework, keeping the patient and their community at the center of everything, something that's especially important for vulnerable communities. This method helps to create better trust and higher engagement, and this is why we've been able to consistently achieve excellent results with highly satisfied patients, families, and payers. So in summary, all of these great features come together and work within our interoperable environment of services, providing you a powerful, balanced solution that encompasses the whole healthcare system that the patient and their family exists within. Thank you so much for your time today and for listening. We're happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Katie, and thank you, 360 Medling. Great presentation. Laura, I'm going to invite you to ask a question or two to 360 Medling. Okay, great. Thank you, Katie. It's good to hear from you again. My pleasure. Um, I had a question and I think you answered it um, in this presentation, you know, uh, when I saw the presentation before, it's just, there's a lot of uh, things about it that's super impressive and um, the discussion about reaching older children and, you know, I have a concern about the ages, you know, more like six to eight. Mm -hmm. um, so did I understand you to say that you could customize this solution to that age group? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, is that or or Manasseh, you can provide some provide some more details, but yes, we can customize our solution. Okay. And then um, I saw on the previous screen you had a little icon for data analytics. What type of data analytics can this uh, solution provide? So this is really in terms of what we would build for you and what we would discover is important to you and your community when we were building the solution. But this can be anything from looking at like an asthma control test score or number of emergency room visits um, to just rates of engagement with the app um, or the the data or the, uh, the healthcare provider platform. Sorry, that's what I was trying to say. Okay. And then, um... What source did you use to vet your accuracy of your data that, you know, as far as these children learning about their asthma? Uh, so, I mean, our TAVI platform is, has been clinically validated in a partnership with the University of McGill and perhaps Dr. Saad or Manasseh, you can provide a little more detail on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for, for the first question regarding the age, uh, we focused here on our presentation for the first pilot on the uh, older uh, older pediatric ages, as we would like to, to target this age group to, to help them transition through the, their journey with asthma and transition from the uh, late pediatric early adolescence up to adulthood, which is a, a strong barrier. And uh, the, the second question regarding the data, um, what, what we've been doing in our other uh, disease areas intervention is that we use the, first we collect the data uh, through the, our electronic platforms and we use it to uh, modify, adapt to the population needs. So we, we, we strongly claim that we are a very patient-centric approach to meet the needs and the, the, uh, the requirements of the population as well as the stakeholders. Right. Very nice. Thank you very much for this. I appreciate it. Yeah, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Now we have another company from Montreal, Canada, who also has clients in the U.S. called Thoracis. Yvonne, are you on the call? Yes, I see you. Yes, I'm ready. All right. It's your turn. Very good. Um, I'm just going to... Um, I cannot start my video, unfortunately, because it says the host has stopped it. Uh, okay, you want to start sharing your slides and then we'll figure out the video? Yeah, okay, fair, no problem. I'll share the, uh, my screen. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, thank you. Welcome everybody and uh, welcome to the uh, Trust's presentation on the uh, Georgia Healthcare Innovation Challenge about uh, pediatric asthma. A few words on Thoracis. Thoracis uh, is a medical company located in Montreal, uh, developing and selling a diagnostic and monitoring tool for respiratory disease, such as asthma, COPD, CF. And we want to make this easy uh, uh, to do uh, like a uh, 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 like your blood pressure, uh, so it should be an easy thing to do for everybody. So the uh, the challenge today for us is to, and our objective is to try to reduce the number of emergency visits to uh, due to asthma exacerbation at the hospital. We believe we can do this by taking regular measurement and to help patient understand the disease and help them control it. Our approach is based on multiple clinical evidence that we've gathered over time, and we know that early detection, daily monitoring is a sure way to see how asthma evolves. Our proposal is to start with a small group of children who had multiple exacerbation and to enroll additional children as they show up at the hospital. We're, proposal to, we're proposing to roll out a daily self-testing program starting at school under the supervision of the school nurse. With willing kids, we will extend the program at home. The program will be associated with a reward program where we will accumulate points for each measurement leading to a reward. This data is sent to a dashboard where the HCP can monitor the condition and if the situation is worsening, can make an intervention. 
Uh, this way we believe that kids could understand how the disease behave, monitoring themselves and understanding the benefit of their medication. If we look at the rollout over a three, four month period, basically we would start at the school or at the hospital with the initial assessment with our Trimaflow device. And then we would daily monitor the, uh, the kids uh, at school initially with the REOM device. And we're measuring resistance of the lung here. So as we see the situation worsening, alert will be issued and an healthcare professional will intervene to help the, the kids to bring back the, uh, uh, the situation under control and prevent an exacerbation. The tool that we are using are, are two. And the, the first one is our Trimoflow, which is our basic horse horse. It's registered in the US. We've got hundreds of sites that have been using this device. It's fairly simple to use. It's using oscillometry, which is basically a like a, a sonar of the lung. You just breathe normally through the device for 20 seconds. You hold your cheek, you uh, pinch your nose, and uh, 20 seconds later, it's done. And you, and you can start as early as three years of age, and that's the beauty of it. This, the second device is a, uh, it's a new device that we just designed that it's called REOM. And you can see here, you don't need the skilled technician to do the tests. A, uh, this is a small kid, two years old, that's got asthma. And 15 seconds later, you've got the test result. So results are sent to an application, to a smartphone application, and you display the result in a very simple way from green to red, where you can see where you are. And you have also a trend indicator whether you're improving or worsening your condition. This data is sent to the clinician dashboard and where the data could be viewed and the, the alert could be raised. Under the supervision of a healthcare professional, whether it's a school nurse or the practicing doctor or the, the hospital, Dashboard is available to the healthcare practitioner to see the, the overall uh, uh, tendency and trend of the, uh, of the patient. And ultimately the, the kids doing the test themselves, starting to know his condition and uh, helping to manage his condition with the help of the uh, healthcare professional around him. And that's what we're providing as a solution. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you, um, Thoracis. Laura, on to you. Hey, I have a question that I was, I've thought about this since I saw the you know, presentation before. If the school were to be, uh, go back to virtual learning, um, you know, with COVID, what, how could be, what could be another solution, solution instead of starting at the school? Could we, um, how hard would it be, I guess, to, allow the parent to start it and do the daily testing at home if it's it's in a fact it's, we can't involve the school nurse because of the patient. yeah no that that's a good question and i understand well there, there's two things obviously if we start selecting uh, kids at the hospital that's an easy place to start because you can you can show them the device and you can it's as you saw in the video this is not an easy uh, difficult thing to do it's fairly easy to do it's fairly automatic um it's just to Get the, the 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 school give us the chance to build some habit before they go home, and we can see how they're behaving and how it works. So, it's it's more to make sure that they they start using the tool on a regular basis. So I guess the training is not a big thing, and we can start uh, uh, with the visit at the hospital, and we can train them because after that we monitor them. We'll see what's going on and what's happening. Okay, and then the other question I had is you mentioned that they get an alert. So if the child is, if we have to do something with home and they're at home and they're doing this breathing and they're not getting, uh, they, the measurement is, I guess, critical or serious, is there any alert to the family, the patient right then to let them know they've, they, they've got trouble? Well, you saw the, the little display there on the phone. So if they're starting, their resistance is starting to rise, which is an indication that there, something is going on. Uh, they're either going to go on the, on the yellow or if they go on red, there's a problem and that will trigger an alert. Um, okay. So they will see it right away that there's a problem, but the dashboard also will signal that there's an alert there too. Uh, and uh, typically when there is, when the condition is getting uncontrolled, you need to have a healthcare professional to intervene as quickly as possible. And that's, okay, so the, what, that's a general so, indication there. 
Okay, so like if I'm looking at the screen now where it has red, uh, the red green there. That's correct. That's correct. Okay. You, would, you would see you would see a red the, the the children or the parents would see a red thing, and it would uh, would obviously put a warning signal here that you need to call your doctor because there's something okay. there's something going on here. Okay, good. Well, thank you, thank you. This is a great um, solution, and it's really nice. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tarasis. Um, we had a slide with uh, all three companies for asthma, but I think we're not able to <laughs> project it. So now we have the one and oh, that's that's a good slide. Uh, the one and last company uh, for the second challenge is uh, BMW. No, it's Trax. So go on, Jesse. Uh, it's your turn. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to share. Hi, everyone. I'm trying to scare, share my screen. It's saying that's somebody else is. Uh, so I think we need Yvonne to stop sharing. I I'm I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, none. No worries. No worries. All right. I will start my timer. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Um, so everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Jesse Lindsley. I'm the founder and CEO at Thrust Interactive. We are a game, a mobile game and app development company started uh, almost 15 years ago here in Atlanta. Um, and uh, unlike most game companies, uh, you won't find a lot that are NIH backed and have gone through uh, rigorous product development um, programs like Flashpoint, uh, but we have and, and that's kind of what makes us different. Uh, we got into pediatric um, medicine eight years ago when my daughter was born and ended up at Children's Health of Atlanta. Uh, and we've been um, aware of this challenge uh, uh, that Navison Health was having with pediatric asthma uh, and got to be take part of a steering committee that looked at the challenges and the kind of the solution landscape. Uh, so we've had the opportunity to think about this solution uh, for two plus years. Uh, being a part of that steering committee uh, was a just amazing opportunity for a startup uh, looking for authentic demand, doing customer discovery. Uh, and, uh, and we credit uh, where this solution has evolved over the last two years uh, to our initial um, collaboration sessions with Navison Health. So we're very grateful for that and grateful to be here. Uh, never been a part of a, of a reverse pitch. Uh, you would think you would find solutions that were kind of uh, competitive, if you will. Uh, but uh, we've had the opportunity to learn more about our colleagues here that we're pitching against. And, and you know, it's, we would love the opportunity to collaborate with, with both of them. Uh, They're very different than what, uh, than what we do. So Trex Health is a gamification of uh, condition management. I won't go into a lot of detail about how difficult it is to, to manage asthma, uh, but just like a lot of these conditions, um, the content that is used to distribute to uh, parents um, caregivers is usually a piece of paper. It might be an email these days, um, but this is an example of what uh, uh, a, a management asthma plan might look like. Um, there are things like discharge papers that you'll get uh, at a, uh, when you leave the hospital, um, and we take that uh, and, uh, and make it uh, fun to, to consume. So uh, our solution is very much a fun, habit-forming, at-your-own-pace um, type of uh, rollout. Uh, our app is not going to look like a medical digital health app. It's going to look like a game. Uh, it's going to keep kids coming back, uh, and it's going to be fun first. Uh, then we start to sprinkle, sprinkle in the spinach, the educational content, uh, and this kind of daily engagement is how we change behaviors. Uh, so how it works, uh, we present, uh, again, the kinds of content that uh, usually is very rote and um, very dull. Uh, in a way that uh, kids feel excited about it and are actually hungry to come back to the app every day. Um, the, again, the app's not gonna look like a, a digital health app. It's gonna feel like Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley. Uh, uh, and these are types of games that are very, uh, that have wide appeal. Uh, and then we also leverage cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, specifically um, one called Tiny Habits. Uh, where we are uh, looking to make everybody feel good about your progress uh, every day. So one of the big differentiators of our solution that, that uh, we worked on over the last two years is we're looking for something that makes, that is useful for the child as well as the parent. Uh, and a lot of times in this help, in this managing of a child's condition, uh, the parent becomes the nag uh, and it can be very hard on them. And what we create is this cooperative game 
uh, if you will, where the parent gets to feel like the hero uh, and they're enjoying that experience as well. And the children are enjoying their parents' involvement in the management of their condition. Uh, the clinician portal, this is that, um, this is, it's almost like that, uh, it's, we have this two carrot and a stick technique. It's this idea that everything that I'm doing will be visible to my uh, clinician. Uh, and I'm not gonna cram for my clinician meeting in the parking lot. Uh, they're gonna be able to see my progress that I'm making uh, and be able to interject uh, as, uh, um, you know, as necessary. Uh, it's also important to understand that this is uh, Trex's condition agnostic. So where we can support ages ranging from uh, basically three and four up uh, and parents uh, can be just for parents um, or uh, parents and children, um, but it's not, uh, it's not condition specific. So we are working in a, in a rural population uh, on uh, supporting parents with uh, kids with autism. Uh, we're also working with Stanford's uh, allergy and asthma clinic on their rollout of their oral immunotherapy program. And uh, that's my time and, and that's my presentation. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank you, Trex and Dust. Uh, Laura, it's on to you. So, um, Jesse, the content, I know, you know, we talked about the, the younger children and the game looked like it was certainly geared toward younger children. How about those that do are a little older, um, 12, 13, 14, uh, you know, one of the patients we have now is 14 that keeps coming back to the ER. Is, can the game be um, a, adapted to a little bit older that it's not corny to the older teenager? Yeah, so that's one of the things, if you think about it, at the end of the day, the algorithm that we're building is a content serving algorithm. And so creating that content, um, uh, basically somebody consuming concept content that is easy, uh, they get to move on to maybe more adult or, or more uh, an older type content, uh, something that is somebody is struggling with, uh, we can steer them to towards, um, you know, more basic content. So. Uh, that uh, that path, unlike a piece of paper, uh, the path of the content and the games that you play uh, uh, don't have to be linear. And so it's think of it like choose your own adventure. Um, and um, and so as you level up, uh, we think about these uh, the content in kind of week to thirty day challenges uh, and being able to kind of speed through things uh, at your pace uh, is is very much a part of the platform. Okay, and then um, that's great that it's you can customize it in that way. On that clinical clinician portal, the cl can the clinician see through that portal how often the child is participating with it or using their app or what does the clinician see yeah. through that portal? Well, well they can see. Uh, so one of the things. So the answer to that is yes. Um, we that is the number one. Um, piece of data uh, that we are looking for is that daily engagement. Uh, if we can achieve daily engagement, we can change behaviors. If we're not achieving uh, that high level of engagement, changing behaviors is, is going to elude us, right? So um, so not only are we able to uh, show that engagement, we are, but we're able to show how that content is consumed. We can show uh, questions that are answered incorrectly. We can show um, exercises that are skipped. We can show videos that aren't played to completion. And so this is another level of, of feedback uh, of what basically uh, clinicians are creating or leverage that have been created and getting real-time feedback on whether that specific content that may have been successful in another environment may not be successful in this environment. Um, so uh, these, are, these are analytics that are very um, you know, innate in games uh, and now we're bringing that into healthcare. Okay, good, thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this has been a, a long awaited uh, labor of love. Um, uh, this horde of individuals started almost two years ago, having conversation about this event. And so we're just so excited and happy to see it uh, coming to fruition. Uh, I have the distinct honor today to announced the two challenge, challenge, challenge winners uh, for the first annual Georgia Health Information Challenge. Um, and when we put this together, we, we talked about, you know, being a little different around this, having a reverse pitch and then a forward pitch like Shark Tank. 
And so uh, I can't uh, announce a winner without at least giving a quote from uh, one of the individuals from Shark Tank, Mark Cuban. Um, and the quote goes as follows. Uh, it comes down to finding something you love to do and just trying to be great at it. And it's, it's clear to say that I think every one of the participants uh, have a passion for uh, this industry, a passion for what they're doing, and they presented solutions that truly are, are great. And so it was a very, very difficult decision for our uh, sponsors uh, to, uh, to select the winner. So without further ado, uh, for our first challenge, uh, rising risk beneficiaries for TC2, our winner is Javion. <laughs> Congratulations, Javion. Um, again, it was a very difficult choice, but at the end of the day, um, Dale felt like Javion brought the right solution to meet their most immediate needs. So um, congratulations again. I just want to ask Dale if he had a few words he wanted to share about um, the contest and uh, any thoughts around his decisions. Well, I certainly do. Uh, and first off, this was the first time I've been involved in this type of process. And I think, you know, to the team that really has supported this beginning uh, to end, thank you so very, very much. Uh, from our standpoint, from Kimberly's standpoint and mine, being involved in this, uh, we got a lot of benefit. And this was a hard decision because every single one of the four finalists would have meaningfully improved our analytics. Uh, and I really had no doubt about that. But different approaches, uh, using you know some basic data, so it would have been a substantial improvement for us. The final decision came down to a couple of additional factors. One, as we said before, and everybody heard today, claims are a primary data source. To the extent we had a partner in JVM that could add this, uh, the SDOH data very, very quickly and uh, improve the accuracy near term of those analytics is important because for us a quick start becomes critical. Uh, and there was another factor around the, the integration, the usability of, of the template that immediately uh, you know, Kimberly could see would fit in very, very well for our population health team and their ability to provide those updates. And you know, as you heard earlier, the ability for those updates in terms of you know, care activity to be integrated into the overall model. So, you know, for us, we're, we're thrilled uh, to announce JVM, but we had uh, a wonderful experience and we're very impressed with all uh, of the finalists. Thank you so much, um, Dale. And, and did we want to give JVM a, a moment to uh, say a few words as well? Seems apropos. Well, I'd, I'd love to for just a brief moment. Thank you, Christopher, uh, Dale, Chris, JC, Isabel, uh, everyone we've had an opportunity to work with. Honestly, this has been a very fun, fun, exciting process. We clearly are excited and, and honored to be picked here. Um, uh, very excited about working with uh, Dale, you and your team um, are excited about what we're going to be able to do together. So uh, short and sweet, but really, thank you very much. We're super excited. So thank you. Congratulations. Now, Last but certainly not least, uh, moving on to our second challenge. Uh, again, I think, you know, uh, this was uh, interesting enough. I have another quote, and I think it's really apropos from another one of our uh, Shark Tank um, um, individuals. And the quote says, nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And that's from Kevin O'Leary, who's one of the uh, original Shark Tank members. Uh, and I think in this particular challenge, that was absolutely true. I mean, there was just such a diverse group of companies that presented with a wide variety of solutions and, and approaches that I, I think, you know, as um, the team started um, at looking at uh, these solutions and trying to make a, a decision, it was really a challenging process because there were so many very interesting and innovative ideas. Um, but we did have to make a selection uh, for one final challenge winner. And that winner is Trex. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, thr Thrust. <laughs> thrust. <laughs> Who has the Trex product? Uh, congratulations, Thrust, the team of Thrust, for um, uh, winning the first annual challenge. Um, we're excited to uh, uh, see your product uh, go 
not only from this idea, but also actually get implemented um, at, uh, uh, with Laura and her team as well. So uh, Laura, I know you had a few words you wanted to share and thoughts about the whole experience. So I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I just thought all three um, solutions, I wanted all three. Um, each each um, company had something that was just great that I felt like could impact the um, pediatric asthma challenge. Um, what, what it came down to was just, um, I felt like Thrust checked the, the majority of the boxes um, with our challenge, uh, particularly the gamification, just being able to, to let these kids uh, make it fun. Um, but like I said, I loved the three, all, the, all of them. Um, this is, like Dale said, this is my first experience in, in doing this. I, I laugh, I told the, the coaches earlier in this that I've been in healthcare for 37 years and it's funny, you take things for granted. You just see products that help fit your solutions, but you never get a chance to really tell the, what your problem is or what your challenge is. So it was fun to be able to present a challenge and then have such brilliant minds come up with solutions. So I'm just honored to be a part of this and I look forward to what we can do um, with Trex and the gamification. So I'm excited about it. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Absolutely. And thank you both. Thank both of our challenge sponsors for their support and their their um, cooperation and and just their overall commitment to this event. We were so uh, excited when they agreed to participate, and the journey has been one I think all of us have really appreciated. So again, congratulations to both of our challenge winners. Uh, and now I will turn it back over to you, Chris, for final comments. Well, I think we did skip something there. Oh, I'm we'll, sorry, I did, I did. We'll see to, right. uh, to say something. Exactly, yes. I apologize, guys. Yes, let's uh, have the folks from Thrust uh, say a few words. Yeah, well, well, thank you for the opportunity. I, I think for us, um, like I said in the presentation, we've been aware of this challenge, we've been aware of this team. We have wanted to work with Valerie and, uh, you know, and what she had created in, in this asthma camp. Uh, it's been it's been I, I, no joke an inspiration in, in what we've created. It was this: how can we take content that uh, works in person and make it work uh, digitally and impact lives? So uh, we appreciate the resiliency of the NAFSA team to resurrect this. Uh, if if the Trex and Thrust team is anything, it's resilient. Uh, and so, uh, but I will say that uh, I just told somebody from the um, Thrasis team that if we had seen their solution two and a half years ago. I think that project would have taken off then. And so I think it, it's my job and our job uh, to steward uh, integration, if you will, with Thrasis uh, as well as 360 Medlink. We like what they're both doing. They, they are very complimentary to what we feel like we can, uh, we can do. And so um, it just worked. I think this was fantastic and uh, thanks for letting us be a part of it. No, that's great. And uh, it's great to hear that you guys are collaborating and having conversations after this event. I think one of the things that we were hoping to see happen is that we would build this community of, of entrepreneurs and technologists and find ways to leverage each other going forward. So it's good to hear that you guys are communicating after the fact. But again, congratulations. And again, I'll turn it back over to Chris for final thoughts. Thank you very much. Congratulations again uh, to both the winners. Uh, outstanding job. Um, you guys did make it really hard for Dale and Laura. There's some long conversations and multiple conversations. So uh, just a couple things to wrap up here. Um, both of you guys will be on the phone with Dale and Laura next week on Monday, <laughs> if you haven't exchanged messages already, because uh, I know they, they want to continue the dialogue, don't want to lose much time, and you guys will need you know next couple of months to prepare for that. So. Uh, congratulations. One of the things that, um, and we call it beta tests, they're really pilots that you will, you know, especially in Jade Gun's case. I know, Todd, you, you made that point and, and we heard you. Um, whether it takes three, six, or nine months, whatever, what we like to do, and this is a, sort of a pre invitation, once you, both uh, challenges you guys get through your pilots, uh, we'd like to come back and have uh, a post event. Could be next summer, maybe next fall, whenever it is and put you guys both on stage, Dale and Laura, and then also the CEOs of the two companies uh, to share with everybody what your results of the pilots were. And so uh, I think that'll be a, put a nice capstone on, on, on the entire event. So um, just wanted to share that. If you wanna keep track of what's going on throughout the pilot, we're not gonna post daily or weekly like we've been doing the last uh, 13 weeks, but we will post periodically. So go back to the website that you uh, have gotten used to and we'll continue to update it uh, as we move through those pilots so you can 
you can catch updates with that. The other thing we'd like to do tonight is we want to highlight uh, some events that three of our organizations are having. This will just be real quick. Um, as you know, I'm with a, the chair of TAG Digital Health. We have our leadership summit coming up on November 12th. We have people from the White House, from the CDC speaking, Walmart Health, Google Health, Microsoft Health, Cerner, Altscripts, a lot of local Georgia companies, CEOs and CTOs speaking. It's a half day event from 1230 to six. We would love to have you guys uh, come out. And so here's the website, uh, tag digital health summit, excuse me.com. And so uh, we'd love to uh, have you come join us. Um, and then also uh, Christopher has some uh, activities coming up with Georgia Hymns. Yes, absolutely. I won't read them all here, but I would just encourage you to uh, go to our Georgia Hymns website. You can see the list of activities that we have coming up. Uh, the chapter generally has some sort of event, uh, networking activity, thought leadership event, um, you know, uh, advocacy related event uh, monthly. And so please go to our website and see the current events that are taking place. Uh, as you can see, uh, TAG and Georgia Hymns, we support each other and we're promoting their event as well on, on our site. And we also encourage you to, to support that as well as some of our upcoming events as well too. So we look forward to seeing you uh, virtually at um, the, both the TAG event and the upcoming Georgia Hymns events. Thank you. And uh, before we move on, uh, Christopher, uh, with Georgia Hymns and maybe with TAG Digital Health, we've co-organized Digital Health Day at the Capitol, the Georgia State Capitol for the last 10 or 11 years. We'll do it again this year. Georgia Hymns taking the lead and us riding shotgun with them. So we don't know what kind of virtual event that'll be, but we're in the planning process and that'll be in January, February. So you'll probably see that on both our websites. And now I'd like to ask A.T. Gimbel to share uh, what you guys have coming up. Great, thanks, Chris. Uh, and you know, thanks again to everybody for being a part of this, this challenge. We really enjoyed it. Uh, but we host a series of healthcare entrepreneur meetups uh, regularly out of the Atlanta Tech Village. They're virtual now, but to connect entrepreneurs, uh, practitioners, investors, folks in the ecosystem to network uh, and hear stories from others doing great things in healthcare. So our next one is Wednesday, December 9th, uh, you can register at landaventures.com slash healthcare. Uh, they're free uh, to, to folks. And it's with uh, Angela Fasaro, who's both a physician and a uh, founder as well. So it should be a good conversation. 